All right, here is section 2.2. And in 2.2, I go through a lot of definitions for you in your notes. So if you refer to your notes, you'll be able to see them or just follow along and I'll define them for you here. First several problems are just definition problems like in 2.1. All right, let's start off with number one. Blank are the categories by which data are grouped. This is known as a class. So classes are categories by which data are group, grouped. All right, the blank class limit is the smallest value. That's going to be known as the lower class limit. And the class limit with the largest value is going to be known as the upper class limit. Okay? All right. The blank is the difference between consecutive lower class limits. This is known as the class width. That's in your notes as well. Okay? Now, this one you're not going to have any clue about. You're going to see it later. I'll refer, possibly refer to it later. They state or ask you true or false, stem and leaf plots are particularly useful for large sets of data. Now, we have yet to see a stem and leaf plot. We will see one later. Um, and the answer is actually false. It's not. You'll see why later. And hopefully I'll remember to refer to it. If I don't, just know that they're not good for dealing with large sets of data. All right. The next problem here shows you a bar graph, right? It gives you a distribution of some sort, a bar graph of sorts, a vertical, um, and asks you, the shape of the distribution shown is best classified as skewed left. Now, if you're looking at your notes, skewed left always refer to, or skewness refers to the way that your graph is shaped. So I'm gonna do it like this. And then I'll do it, yep, not bad. Okay, notice how this one trails off to the right, and this one sort of trails off to the left. I didn't do a great job of that. So, skewness, if you look at your notes, if it trails off to the left, if the tail of it, this is definitely not the best version of it, but if the tail of it trails off to the left, then it, this is known as skewed left. If the tail trails off to the right, this is known as being skewed to the right. So if you look at my particular problem, my tail skews and trails off to the right. You guys follow me? So because it is trailing off to the right, this would be known as, my graph would be known as being skewed right. But the claim here is that this shape is skewed left. That's false, okay? It is skewed to the right. So answer yours. Now, quick note, while we're on the topic of being skewed, this is, this right here, where it's even, is known as being a bell. And I talk about this in your notes because the skewness is even on each side. It's a bell curve. Okay, so, and there's a, a couple others, but there's one other in, in your notes known as being uniform. We, we'll deal with it when it comes up, but just wanted to throw that out there. Everybody got that? Okay. All right, let's go on to number six. The following frequency histogram represents the IQ scores of a random sample of seventh grade students. Okay, IQs are measured to the nearest whole number. The frequency of each class is labeled above each rectangle. Use the histogram to answer parts A through G. All right, so let's look at my problem here. Um, so what they're saying is that we've got a frequency histogram, a bar graph, and this frequency histogram represents a certain table of values related to IQ scores of random seventh grade students. The first question they ask is how many students were sampled? How could we easily find out how many students were sampled just from looking at this? Add up what? Exactly, add up the frequencies for each of the categories or classes, right? So here's one class. It has one person in it that falls into this IQ range. Here's the next class. Two people fall into this and so on. Everybody with me so far? Now, I don't have my calculator, so I can probably do most of this in my head, 
But if somebody wants to add it up and beat me to it, I'd really appreciate it. I'm gonna get going, but hopefully somebody can beat me to mine since I don't have my calculator. See if I can add. Nope. Two hundred. I missed a twenty there. Thank you. All right. So there are two hundred total students in my study. Okay. So there's two hundred total students in my study. Now determine the class width. So the class width is what the range that each class covers. Now. This is a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna help you with it. Let's just take this one for example. 60 to 70. Well, that would be 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69. Do we count 70? No, 70 would begin the next one. Everybody with me so far? So the width is this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Starting at 60, but ending at 69, and the next one is 10, starting at 70, and ending at 79, and so on. Everybody follow? Okay, so the class width for my problem, probably gonna be the same for yours, is 10. Got it? Okay. All right, next one. Well, I actually helped answer this question for you in what I just did here. So if you look at this one, they ask, identify the classes and their frequencies. Well, it's really easy to do this one first and foremost because you can eliminate all the, all the wrong answers simply by the, the class widths that they bring up. Notice how part A or option A tells you that the class width is 60 to 70. We just agree that that was incorrect. This is wrong, so this one's out. How about this one? Is there a class width of 65? No, that's not it. That doesn't exist, so that's wrong. So immediately, C is the correct answer. 60 to 69, one person. 70 to 79, two people, and so on. Everybody follow? Any questions about that at all? Okay, so just from looking at and understanding the class widths, it helps you answer that question. All right, next. Which class has the highest frequency? Well, in order to answer that question, all you have to do is look at which one of these classes has the biggest number. For mine, the biggest number is 52. There are 52 people that fall within this IQ range of 90 to 99. So for mine, the 90 to 99 IQ range has the most amount of people. Any questions about that at all? Yours might be different, it just depends on the problem. Okay, next, which class has the lowest frequency? So this is the complete opposite, isn't it? It's the opposite to what we just did. We don't want the class with the most, we're now looking for the class with the smallest number, which is actually this one over here. The 60 to 69. Now be careful, don't choose 60 to 70, right? That's not correct. 60 to 69 is the class with the lowest frequency. What percentage of students had an IQ test of at least 130? So, Take a look here, at least 130. At least 130 means that what? We're starting here and taking everybody within this range. Everybody got that? So that means there's eight, 12, 14 people that fall within an IQ range of 130 to 160, or in other words, 130 and above, because we don't have anybody past 160. Is 14 the answer though? No, it's not. You want to know the percent. If you want to know the percent, then you need to do what with the 14? Divide it by the total number of people in your study, in your sample. 
I don't have that, so I'm gonna guess that's 7% because half of 200 is 100, half of 14 is seven. I'm gonna guess that's 7%, okay? Any other questions? All right, now, let's answer the next part, shall we? Did any students have an IQ of 167 in my sample? Well, all you gotta do is go look at your sample and see if you had anybody that, that falls in that category. For me, I don't have 167. My graph stops at 160, which means that the last category that had students fall into it, the last class, was 150 to 159. Now, if there was one, it would show but there's not, so no, because there is there are no bars or frequencies that are greater than an IQ of 160. Okay, and that's it for that one. All right, any questions about the previous problem at all? Great. All right, for ages of hearing aid patients, state whether you would expect a histogram of the data to be bell-shaped, uniform, skewed left, or skewed right. This one's interesting. Well, I need to bring up the next one. Uniform means that it's just basically one single bar. So in other words, your data, your peaks are all at the same height. You guys follow? Skewed right is where your peaks are like this. Skewed left is something like this. Bell shaped is where they have even peaks. So you can imagine little bars underneath all these that form like the shape of those curves, right? There is no curve to a uniform distribution. That's one type. Here's a skewed right, here's a skewed left, and here's a bell shape. It's, these are the four general distribution shapes, or shapes of distributions. So the question in mind is, if you had a hearing aid patient or hearing aid patients, state whether you would expect a histogram of data to be bell shaped, uniform skewed, or skewed, skewed right. So let's take a look at this. Let's pretend to make a frequency histogram. This would be the frequency. How many fall into this category? Let's just say 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people. This would be what? Age, right? Let's call it 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age. Are we gonna have a ton of people in the 10 years of age with hearing aids? Not nearly as many as we're gonna have over here, aren't we? As people get older, what happens? They need more and more of that type of assistance. So I highly doubt that it's gonna be uniform that every age bracket needs the same amount of hearing aids, right? So that's out. It's not gonna be skewed right because younger people don't need hearing aids more than older people. It's not gonna be bell-shaped, meaning that middle-aged people need the most amount of hearing aids. It's going to be skewed to the left. Do you guys follow? So that's a way to do it. Now, I don't think that you're gonna have the exact same problem as mine, but the way to do your problem is to possibly create a little scenario like I do, right? Instead of trying to picture it in your head, draw it out. Frequency, your whatever your metric is, whatever you're measuring, and what you think logically, using some common sense, what things would kind of look like, and then match it to one of these. Anybody have one that they're not sure of? Have a question? Are we okay, you got yours? All right, fantastic. So that's kind of a tricky problem if you don't draw a picture of it. All right? Okay, let's go on to number eight, shall we? 
So I'm going to erase the uniform one because this is, that's the most easy one to kind of remember. It's these that, especially these two, that could be a little bit tricky for some people. All right, so let's look at number eight. To predict future enrollment in a school district, 50 households within the district were sampled and asked to disclose the number of children under the age of five living in the household. The results of the survey are presented in the table, complete parts A through C. All right, ready? We're gonna go through and open Excel, okay? We're gonna go through here and open Excel for this data set, and we're gonna practice doing the same thing that we did in what? The last problem of the last section, okay? So we're gonna do the exact same thing that we did in the last problem of the last section, get a little more practice in on that. Okay, you guys ready? So, here's my data set. It's the same data set that's over here. You guys see that? Okay. And we need to, to put in the relative frequency, don't we? The very first thing we need to do is, as you recall, and I don't expect you to know it yet, we need to add up or sum the frequencies. So you would add the frequencies. Remember the function is to equal sum, select the first one, the last one, holding the shift key, and then it will add them up for you. Is with me so far and could you add it all by yourself sure you can it's, you don't need excel to do this but it's just easier for me to show you and it saves me the work of typing it in okay now what do we do next we now need to do the relative frequency column so that relative frequency column is what is going to go right here in our answer how do we do the relative frequency well, the relative frequency is the ratio of the frequency to the total number of items, total number of um, people sampled in our study. So the relative frequency of zero number of children under the age of five is 16 out of the 50 total people that were sampled, or family households that were sampled. So there's that. And I can do that for all of the others. You guys with me so far? Anybody got any questions? Please ask. Okay, so I'm going to just go do all this division. There is a shortcut. I'm not going to show it to you yet, but I don't want to. I want you to get a little bit of practice so that you can understand how we're doing this. Could you do this by hand? Absolutely. Could you do this on a calculator? Absolutely. I, again, I just do it on Excel because it makes it easier. Is there a way to check my work before I go put this in? What can I do to check my work? Make sure they equal one. Exactly. Make sure they equal one. So I'm going to check the sum of my relative frequencies. If the sum of my relative frequencies is one, I probably did a good job, right? And it is. So now I know with high likelihood that I did a good job with my relative frequency entry and calculations, and I did. Okay. Any questions about that at all? You guys doing okay? Ready to move on? Okay. By what percentage of households, or sorry, what percentage of households has two children under the age of five? So in order to answer this question, we need to look at our relative frequency distribution. So what percentage of households has two children under the age of five? So for mine, two children corresponds to this class, okay? So do I enter 0.26? No, because they asked for the percentage, which means I need to convert that to a percentage, move it, two to the right, 26%. Make sense? Okay. 
Now, if they asked for the proportion, then you would just put 0.26. But since they asked for the percentage, you put it as a percentage. You convert it to a percentage. Okay, let's look at the next part of it. What percentage of households has one or two children under the age of five? One or two. Now, we did a problem very similar to this. When they use the word or, key word, what can we do? We add together those categories, right? Those classes. One or two means that we can take the 0.3 and the 0.26 Put them together as one. You guys follow? Now, because they ask for percentage, we do not put in 0.56, we put in 56%. Make sense? Any questions about that at all? We okay? All right, great. And that's it for that problem. Now, for the first time, we see a stem and leaf plot display, whatever we want to call it, but it's stem and leaf. We'll come back to this stuff later. We'll just leave this here for now. So, we have a stem and leaf display of data. And what we want to do is, let me show you how to read this. They give you a key, actually. This is known as the stem. This is known as the leaf, okay? So the stem, in this case, here's a legend. It's very important to read the legend because the legend tells you how to interpret this. And I'll, I'll explain in just a moment. This legend says that the stem represents the item in front of the decimal. That bar is this bar. The two, or the item to the right of the bar, represents the item to the right of the decimal point. Let's look at some examples. So this and this would be 10.1. Then 10.6. Then another 10.6. And then a 10.8. And so on and so on and so on, all the way down over here, which would be 14.2 and 14.4. You guys following me? Now, I said a moment ago that it's very important to pay attention to the legend. Why? Because if this legend said 5 slash 2 represents 52, then that would change things. And it could happen that way as well. So it would be 101, 106, 106, 108, 142, 144, and so on. You with me? So you must pay very close attention to the legend. If you misread the legend, you will misread your data. Look at that. Follow me? Okay. So, and that's certainly wrong. So what's the right answer? C for me is the correct answer. So... Make sure that you read, read, read your legend properly. You read the legend improperly, you're going to have an incorrect answer. Any questions about that at all? Got it? Okay. Legend guides you to read your stem and leaf display. There it is. Oh, you guys good? Okay. Any questions about that? All right. Excellent. Let's go to the next one. We're almost done. So, this next one, let me erase this. Okay. Uh, this next one says, a researcher wanted to determine the number of televisions in a household. He conducts a survey of 40 randomly selected households and obtains the data in the accompanying table. Complete parts A through H below. All right, so I'm going to close out this one, and I'm going to open up a new data set, okay? So let me look at my table here. I'm going to open up this new data set. So there it is. So uh, if you didn't see that, quick note, let me go back. This little box right here, 
click that for your data set. Then you have the double boxes here like we've seen earlier. Open that in Excel. All right. I'm gonna open this up. Whoops. data discrete or continuous. Now, I made a little note, I believe I made a note, in your, yes, I did make a note in your notes to remind you what discrete and continuous was. If you forgot it, it's in your notes in kind of like the bottom right corner of it. Discrete is countable, whole numbers. Continuous is not countable. So, is this data discrete or continuous? Well, you can count the number of televisions in a household. One, two, three, four, five televisions, whatever it happens to be. So this data is discrete because they can only have whole number of values and are countable. Okay, so this is discrete because they can be whole, they're whole and countable. All right, here we go. So, this is a little bit tedious. So you can do yours, you can do mine. This is a little bit tedious. So I've got, I need to go through here and I need to go through all of these, ready? So how am I gonna create my frequency distribution? I create my frequency distribution, first and foremost, here's the first class of zero. These are the families that reported they have no TVs in their house. I need to go to my frequency and find out how many zeros I have in my data set. The number of zeros I have in the data set, that goes there, and so on and so on. So I'm gonna count it up. Let's see what we've got. So I've got one, two, I only have two. Go ahead and do yours. Okay, so I'm not gonna say anything out loud because I might confuse you with your numbers. I'm now gonna move on to my ones. I'm done counting mine. Could have easily made a mistake. What's a way that I can try to quickly check my work? They said they surveyed 40 families. What should this add up to? 40. Why does it not add up to one? Because it's not the relative frequency. The frequency should add up to the total number that you surveyed. So, an easy way to check your work when you're dealing with just the frequency is if they tell you how many are surveyed, then it should add up to that. So 15, 29, 30, I got it. Thank goodness. So if you check your work, it should add up to your total frequency or total number of respondents, okay? So now that I've got that, I can go do my relative frequency. So I'm going to go make my own chart. Take a look here. Now 
Now take a look at what I just did here. Okay, let me erase some stuff there because I kind of have some things in the way. What did I do over here on my chart? So I created this in my Excel spreadsheet. Okay, you guys see that? Just like we would have in a previous problem. They did it for us before, now I make it myself, no problem. I know that this right here should be 40, right? But of course, what you need to do because you know how to do your relative frequencies is you do need to sum those up so that you have it so that we can do the division, right? So there it is, 40. So now I can go do my relative frequencies, this divided by the 40 and so on all the way through. Notice how those problems are coming back to us, but it's no big deal. There's a short, again, there's a shortcut for this, but I'm not giving it to you yet because we'll, we'll have that shortcut for many problems later, and it's easier to just have you practice on here. Now again, if I sum all these up, it should equal one, and they do. So I'm gonna go input my relative. Now that we've practiced several of them, hopefully you're getting a little bit better at them. And of course, you can always go back, watch this video, and um, double check your work and practice some more. Okay. Any questions about that at all? All right, very good. Let's go to the next problem. What percentage of households in the survey have three televisions? So now all I have to do is look at my relative his, relative frequency, um, not histogram, relative frequency distribution, go find the three. Well, for me, three TVs is right here at 0.15. So that's going to be 15%. Notice this is the same stuff that we've been doing. We've done several problems like this, so don't panic. It's the same stuff that we've been doing, so that's 15%. Next one, what percentage of households have four or more? Okay, four or more. So what's four or more? Well, that means it covers the four and the five, which is this one and this one. So four or more is both of those. So that means that I would want to add those two together Together, they are 0.125. Well, what's 0.125 as a percent? 12.5%. Okay. And now let's go find the picture that goes along with this. So your diagram of the frequency should match what we did earlier. So Take a look here, going all the way back to the beginning of the problem. Now, all this stuff we've done before, but they're throwing it all together in one problem now. They want a picture of what's going on here. What's the picture? Well, if I were to look at this, this would be a small number. Then we got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger than that. Smaller, smaller, smallest. You guys see that? 2, 13, 14, 6, 4, 1. If I turn this on its side, I should get something that looks like this. Whoops, I actually made that one a little bit too big. You guys see that? Whoops, I missed one. <laughs> I should have a picture that looks sort of like that. Take a look there, okay? Now let's go match something to that. 
Or you can just straight look at the numbers, right? You can actually look at the numbers and match them up. So which one of those pictures looks like my graph here? Well, certainly not that one, not that one, not this one looks like A is the correct one. Does that make sense? Okay, so A is the correct one that matches. And you can always just look at the frequency and match the frequencies up, but the general shape on your data should match it. Now, the next part is to ask, what's the relative frequency? Well, shouldn't the relative frequency also match this general shape? Yes, we discussed that earlier, that the frequency bar graph, the frequency histogram, and the relative frequency histogram should look identical, with the only exception being what is on the vertical axis, the, the ratios. So which one is that? Looks like C for me. None of these other ones look anything like my other picture. C looks like it's the correct one. All right, now finally, double checking your understanding of skewness. This is my answer. Is it skewed right, skewed left, uniform, or bell-shaped? Well, it trails off to the right, so therefore it would be skewed to the right. Yours might be different. So this one's skewed to the right. And that is a really complete problem. If you can do this problem, you have a great understanding of what's going on because it does everything, okay? And notice how we really built up to this problem. We started with individual pieces, and now we can do it all in one. I mean, you might not be perfect at it yet, but you're gonna get there, okay? All right, now, um, what I want to do is I've given you a solid example. You can always come back and look at it. Let me see what time it is. I'm going to skip number 11. I'm going to go to 12 because 11 is just like what we did. Okay. I'm going to go to 12. So 11 is going to be just like what we did here. You're going to go back, watch the video. And it's just like what we did. I need to go to 12 here. Okay. So I can finish this section. All right. So number 12, we return to a stem and leaf plot, display, whatever. The data in the accompanying table represent the ages of the presidents of a country on their first days in office. Complete parts A and B. So here's our table. Let's go look at our table. So here's our table of presidents' ages, all right? So you need to look at your key, your legend, and the legend is basically the same for everybody. Stem, leaf. 42, 45, they're pretty much the same. So which one of these hits all of these numbers? Should you go and do every single one of them? No, be smart about it, work efficiently. And take a look here, what's this one? This means that I should have a 42, 43, 45, 46, 47, 48, two 49s, something like that. Go look through your data set and see how you could eliminate some options by the ones that show up or don't show up. So if I come back over here, what I can do is take a look at my data set here. Go, okay, well, which one eliminates it? Well, 42, 43. Do I have a 42? Yes. Do I have a 43? Yes. This one's out. Why? because it puts them out of order. It should go least to greatest. This one's out, 42, 43, good, good, good. Now, again, let's work smarter. This next row is identical across the board, isn't it? So I'm not even gonna bother looking at it. How about I look at the last row, the last two right here? Maybe that is going to help me finish off my problem. Well. Let's see here, mine and my last ones are a little bit different. This one has a five in it. Do I have a 65? I do have a 65 here. So the question is, where did they run the cutoff? They ran the cutoff at the five should go over here into the next one. Notice, 
This goes up to 40, uh, 44. The first one goes from 40 to 44. Always the first ones go from up to, to the fours in that age category. So this one is out because they included the five in the first bracket and it should cut off there. So this one's out. So let's look at the last one here. 65, 67, 69, these are identical. So that makes it a little bit tougher. We're gonna to have to go back to the middle category to see if we can find where they differ. And so I'm looking at the difference here. This has four 55s, four 55s, three 56s, four 57s, one 58. Okay, let's go back here. Oh, they put this out of order. There it is, there's the wrong piece right here. They put them out of order, this one's out. The answer should be D for me. I mean, look, the worst case scenario is what? You go and you go look through every single one. But if you're working a little bit smarter, go use try process of elimination and look for little hints to eliminate something. All right, okay, now, this was the correct answer for my problem. The question is, is this skewed left, bell-shaped, skewed right, or uniform? Watch. Do this. And decide. What is it? It looks like a bell, doesn't it? So just draw your curve this way, and then imagine it turned upright. This is bell-shaped for mine. Okay. Everybody got that? Okay. All right, number 13. Almost done, you guys are doing great. Okay, number 13. Construct a stem and leaf plot for the data over here. Well, I'm going to show this to you. I'm not going to actually type it in. So just check the legend. I'm going to show this to you. I'm not typing it in to save time. Ready? Watch. 27. That would be a 7 here. Follow? 41. That would be a 1 here. 26. A 6. And don't write anything down yet. You'll see what I mean. 22. A 2. Seven, where does seven go? Exactly, you got it. Seven over here. 21, here, eight, here, four, 35, 18, 17, 25, 13, uh, there it is, 16, 15, nine, 11, 35, 9, 35, 11, 13. Okay, now, this is not how you would enter it. The right way to enter it is watch. 4, 7, 8, 9, 9. No commas or the least to greatest. You guys see that? I just did this so that I could easily write it down. Okay, so this one would be one, one, three, five, six, seven, eight. You guys see that? This one would be one, two, five, six, seven. This one, three, five, five, five. And then that one's just one, of course. So this, exactly like this, would go into this box. Follow? Okay, now, what shape is this? I would think that it's going to be skewed to the right. That's part B, and I don't have it. They won't let me answer it until I put this in. I'm too lazy to write it in. Okay, you get the idea? But they ask you in part B, describe the shape of the distribution. Mine does is heavy on the front end and trails off, which would give me a shape like that, which we know is skewed to the right. Make sense, everybody? Okay. So I kind of rushed through that problem, but I just want you to know, that hopefully gives you an idea of how to deal with it, okay? All right, 
14 is the last one I'm going to do for the day, and it's very straightforward. All right, very, very straightforward. You can always come back to your previous problem, go back, watch this video, fast forward it to get an idea. This is going to be the last one we do. It's not bad. Take a look. Everybody following? Ready? So they give you a data set. They give you a data set. They ask you to construct a dot plot for it. In other words, this would be the number of zeros in your data set. There's only one zero according to this one, if it's true. And so on and so on. So what you're supposed to do is pick the correct dot plot that matches that data set. Let's look at this one real quick. Let's eliminate them, really easy. Zero, this tells me there should only be one zero in there. That looks like it's true, isn't it? This one says there's two, out of the question. Three, out of the question. You guys follow? Process of elimination. I don't have to know it all. I just need to eliminate enough to get down to one answer, right? Let's go to the other end of it. Well, they match, so it doesn't matter. I'm not even going to look for the fives, right? Where do they differ, though? This one says that when you go with the one, right? We go with the ones or the fours. Up to you. Let's go with the ones, shall we? This one says there's a ton of ones. This one says there's only two of them. If there's just two ones, if there's more than two ones, we're done. And there's three alone. This one's out. Here's the right answer. Does that make sense, everybody? Don't go overthinking, working too hard. Use common sense, process of el elimination to get this done. Now, last part of the day. Oh, that's it. We're done. Oh, well, that doesn't. I thought they were going to ask for a skew. And, but if they did, probably I would say this is skewed to the left. Got it? That'll do it.